Thank you very much, David, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this live stream discussion of the uh, Catholic Church's response to what is happening uh, in the global pandemic. It makes sense to me that CMMB and America Media and the Sheen Center would partner to, uh, to host this conversation because this is an, a, a crisis that has multiple dimensions. There's the obvious public health crisis, uh, and there is, a, there is the accompanying economic crisis that we are going through. But each of those crises uh, has physical dimensions, it has psychological dimensions, it has uh, spiritual dimensions. And uh, so it's appropriate that we would call on uh, a diverse range of resources from the Sheen Center to CMMB to America in order to have this conversation today. And I'm really delighted to welcome uh, our two, my two interlocutors, uh, Dr. Mary Leahy, who is the CEO of Bond Secure's Charity Health System. Uh, she has responsibility for setting the system's strategic vision and providing leadership for system-wide operations and performance at three acute uh, care hospitals. Uh, Bruce Wilkinson is the president of the Catholic Medical Mission Board uh, and CEO and oversees uh, all of its operations. Um, my, first of all, welcome to both of you. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, Dr. Leahy, why don't we start with you? I wonder if we could just start out uh, by talking about what you're seeing uh, on the ground right now. So things are doing much better than we were a month ago or, or even two months ago. Uh, we have begun to see uh, a, a great decline in the number of inpatients that we have that are COVID positive, uh, and also out in the community. Uh, we do have, um, we take care of a, a large number of patients across Rockland and Orange counties, and we are seeing a, a decline in the number of new patients that are being diagnosed every day. So that's good news. So we're very pleased about that. Excellent. And uh, Bruce, you, of course, uh, have a great deal of familiarity with what's happening in the international scene. What are you seeing from where you are sitting right now? Yeah, thanks, Matt. And that's great to be on with you and Mary. And thank you, David. Uh, really, what we're seeing is that America actually and, and many of the Western countries have been the epicenter of this, uh, this global health pandemic, which is very unusual, right? We usually believe these things happen in, in other places. So right now, um, we're, we're seeing a slow growth of this epidemic happening in low resource countries, uh, Africa, uh, Caribbean, in uh, some of the Asian countries. And so what we're really finding is that we're, we're wondering if there is just lack of assessment, right? Uh, testing going on. Uh, the case loads are relatively low, yet we know with the infrastructure and the weakness of that inherent health infrastructure that uh, once the epidemic levels reach any 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 semblance of what we've experienced, we are we are in globally uh, in for a, a very very rough time, and especially the vulnerable populations in those countries. Mm -hmm. Now, it seems to me that the 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 special dimension of Catholic healthcare is uh, is caring for the whole person, right? Body, heart, soul, and um, so a question that was raised by uh, you know, one of our one of our viewers. We received a few questions ahead of time. In, involves that idea. How do you how do you care for or be present to um, to one another to the whole person uh, as a Catholic healthcare worker when treatment of this particular disease actually requires isolation? Um, it, it it must compound the the, the challenge uh, tremendously. Is that what you're seeing, Doctor? Well, that's very true. Uh, you know, it, it really presents a very difficult situation. But we must remember, you know, at the core of Catholic social teaching is the dignity of every human being. And that's what makes Catholic health care so relevant in any time. And healthcare workers carry forth this compassion and they do this healing ministry every single day, regardless of whether there's a pandemic. Uh, and as you said, it's not just a physical aspect of healing, but it's also the emotional, the social, and the spiritual support that's provided right at the bedside that's so important to these patients. And as it is more pertinent during this pandemic, uh, patients are very isolated and they're distanced from their friends and their families. Uh, it's, it's a 
very difficult uh, situation for everyone, including the healthcare providers. But what we have to focus on what we can do for our patients, because they are so very ill when they show up at the hospital. Uh, and you know, I'm sure it's very disorienting for them because there are no familiar faces. So we remember that the frontline workers are the living connection for these patients. Uh, and through their pastoral care at the bedside, they're ministering to the needs of the patient through their full presence. They listen, they offer that personal healing touch. And then we've also used the technology to connect patients and their loved ones. We use smartphones, we use various apps like the Family First app, and we use video and telecommunications to make sure that the patient doesn't feel isolated. But most importantly, it's really the bedside touch that matters. Mm. And uh, Bruce, how do you, how do you respond to that challenge of you know preserving that holistic approach in a moment when you're trying to respond to and triage uh, an emergency? Well, it's uh, the the bar is set in the Catholic social teaching, um, and it is I think the distinguishing factor of Catholic health care uh, that we do we recognize the dignity of the person. We also have a real sort of um, a journeying in solidarity with the suffering in the communities. And I think that's where um, our work really distinguishes itself uh, globally from CMB's perspective and many other Catholic uh, health uh, uh, facilities is that we are in a place where if the communities themselves do not feel we are journeying with them, they feel it, they know it. This is a time when culturally, they are collective societies. Most of the societies who work in Africa, for example, are absolutely um, together. Families, many members of the family live in small spaces together. They, they are completely um, connected throughout the day because their daily routine put them in, in, in immediate contact. And to go in with a message that, well, you need to distance, social distancing. You need to um, perhaps treat your, the sick in a very different way than you have previously. Or to go into a hospital system and start triaging people, women just coming from to give birth from others who may be actually be presenting cases of, uh, of infection, it is a very difficult culturally as well as what I would say socially. And then at the spiritual side, people are coming to, to Catholic healthcare because they believe there is that added dimension. They know they'd be welcomed. They know that they'd be embraced. How do we embrace these people as they come? So that has been one of our challenges. Uh, there's many examples of how you can do that. It, it, it really becomes uh, a challenge to rethink how we approach that inclusion, that dignity of the person and the, the embrace they receive when they come for care because it's, it, it, it's critical for their healing. And, and you're not just triaging uh, patients and cases, you're also having to make really tough choices I imagine, uh, in terms of allocating limited equipment, limited resources uh, during a crisis like this. Um, how does Catholic ethics or morality or social teaching uh, really help us to make those choices? Well, you know, we've been very blessed that we didn't have to make those hard decisions. Uh, we had enough uh, equipment uh, to be able to provide the care for every patient that came through our doors, but but we had to be prepared for that. and And that is a very difficult uh, journey. Uh, when faced with this, you know, you can't look at any discriminating factors like age or race or economics or disabilities. You really, again, have to look at the integrity of the human being uh, and recognize the autonomy of the patient and have those discussions with the patient before, uh, you know, before the situation arises and, and certainly take into respect greatly their, their own objectives and what their wishes are. Uh, we also have to follow our moral principles and turn to the ethical and religious directives for guidance. You know, always remembering the dignity of the individual. It, and this kind of, these kind of decisions can't be left to one or two people. It needs to be you know, a small group of an ethics committee that's formed, which uh, I'm sure we all did. Uh, and they should have varying backgrounds, both from uh, pastoral care and health care and, and uh, you know, looking at the fact that there should be consensus amongst that group of people uh, should they have to make that decision. And most importantly, using the discernment process, uh, it's a very powerful tool. Uh, and I think that it should be utilized uh, throughout that prayerful decision making. Mm -hmm. 
And Bruce, are, are, are your folks on the ground facing similarly tough uh, choices and decisions? They are. Um, the, our situation probably from Dr. Leahy um, varies in the sense that we have very limited resources. Um, and yet the uh, pandemic has not hit the proportions we've seen in, in, in uh, the United States, uh, in Europe. So we are still able to, to, to care for and cope, but we've had to um, create um, a lot of sort of what I call the logistical sort of support supply chains for the PPE, uh, protective equipment for frontline health workers. As you know, there are very limited number of health workers in many of these countries, and they are so important to the well-being of their countries. Therefore, their protection and their their well-being is just critical to these nations' future. So, anytime we ever have uh, the, you know a health worker put in danger, it is just really it, it can be a, a, an amazing loss to a community who perhaps is living with only one doctor at a health facility, which is actually often the case. So, where where we see what we're doing a lot is to provide these folks with the PPE, the actual protective equipment. And also our frontline um, health workers, these are people as you're looking at right now on the screen, actually, uh, we're making sure our frontline, these are people who are actually triaging as um, patients come to the hospital. These are also people who are going out into the community, teaching about hand washing, social distancing. And these are what we call community health workers. They are an invaluable asset to their communities because they live and reside within those communities. And this, I think these photographs right here that you're seeing are taken from Haiti, and this is what the triage looks like. We have to have the embrace when they show up. We have to know, they have to know they're loved, yet we have to treat them medically in a way that is actually safe for all and actually has their well-being at heart. So it is not, it is not easy to shift uh, some of our previous practices in these environments into the new, new context when we already were resource constrained. Hmm. And what your responses reveal, of course, is something that we're learning through this uh, crisis, and that is that it, it doesn't affect all of us equally. Uh, some people like uh, Mary, your, your facilities, you know, have had the resources to, to, to grapple with this, uh, others less so. And what we, I think, in the U.S., who don't live on the margins, what we are uh, learning throughout all of this is that this this kind of new normal um is the normal for many poor and and under resourced communities in this country and throughout the world and so the reality of life on the margins is is coming home uh, perhaps people like me who, who don't live there in in a radically different way than it did before what do you think that that experience uh of a, a vulnerability might actually teach us uh, from a from a Catholic perspective, from a social justice perspective, about empathy, about solidarity. So, you know, when we reflect on the teaching of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, um, we know that we must relate to our family around the world, uh, and and it doesn't really matter where we are physically, uh, where we live, uh, or what our beliefs are. Uh, when our Lord said, love one another, he wasn't talking about the people across the street. He was talking about all of us throughout the world. Um, and we need to act that way. Uh, you know, we shouldn't judge. We have to listen and avoid the indifference, I think, is really important. Um, that can occur when suffering doesn't occur on your doorstep. And I think that's perhaps something that has become very real here in the United States, particularly in the New York metropolitan area, that the suffering is now on our doorstep. Um, you know, we're social beings and we therefore must stand in solidarity uh, and in empathy uh, with the poor and marginalized around the globe. And, you know, we have to work for the common good uh, of every single person. And I think that um, this experience perhaps will bring further to mind uh, that that reality. You know, we're all responsible as as we've been told for shaping the future of the of the planet. So we should pray and, and stand together to reaffirm that for our daily actions. Bruce, your thoughts? 
I have lots of thoughts. I'll be careful here. I, I, I spent 30 years living in Africa um, and with my family. And we, we, when we moved back to the States, we um, in to head up CMMB, which was great to experience. Um, we came with a, with a sense that we are vulnerable because we worked in right in the middle of an HIV and AIDS pandemic where, you know, 25, 23% of the population were, were, were infected. And um, that was a that was a health global health pandemic, and it still remains that way um, in many contexts where people are vulnerable to malaria, they're vulnerable to TB, they're vulnerable to HIV. So we, I lived in societies that actually had this sense of vulnerability and the sense of how fragile life can be. And then we come back to America, where uh, I don't think we actually had that same sort of experience, right? We as Americans felt a bit self-sufficient. Uh, we, we're, we're, we're okay, we're protected. And now this new place of we're all vulnerable, we're, we're, we're in solidarity with, with, with people that we never thought we'd be in solidarity with or we weren't, weren't actually in, uh, forced to think about. And it's not just the global populations, it's here in the US. I, I really think this COVID piece has ripped off a bit of the Band-Aid on, 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 the, on the injustices that do exist in the marginalized in our societies. Um, uh, I've seen that and lived that in some of the more difficult contexts in the world. And yet you see the same injustices in our own society. And I think we, we, have, a, we have a deep introspection to right now to look at our own societies and to try to rectify and to bring some justice into the places and have access for all. Um, uh, we act CMB. We have our, in our in our in our in our vision statement, you know, quality access to healthcare for all, right, Res irrespective of person, religion, race. So again, I, I I think this really has made us all feel vulnerable, and we're reassessing all of us our our, our vulnerability in light of um, of what everyone is living around the world at this current moment. And that's really that's a really interesting question that uh, is is prompted in my brain from what you just said, Bruce. The uh, uh, which is what you know. This isn't the first global uh, health crisis that uh, we have lived through. It's not the first that health crisis that you all have lived through. Uh, you know, we've had we we we've dealt with the AIDS crisis. We've dealt with uh, the Ebola crisis. What are are there? What are the similarities and differences uh, in those uh, crises, uh, you know, when you compare them with what we're going through right now? So I, I think if you, again, look at the value of every individual, uh, we're all made in the likeness of God and illness, uh, particularly this illness, uh, doesn't discriminate on who it's going to attack. And I think that that is a, uh, you know, that's pause for us to to uh, think about for for some time. Uh, so if the illness doesn't discriminate, why are we discriminating in you know making in our healthcare uh, in, in providing healthcare to people? Um, so we can't be judgmental. You know, faith and medicine go hand in hand, as far as uh, you know. I believe. Uh, and again, we have to look at the whole person and and the healing of the mind, the body, and, and the spirit. Um, even with limited resources, the power of that human connection, uh, what we've learned through AIDS and Ebola uh, is wonderful. That human connection is there. Um, and there's unity in that human spirit at, at the bedside. Um, we have to remember that we have to be collaborative across national borders uh, in order to be successful. And that is our new normal, uh, that we, we need to be far better at doing that. And we must be flexible. And, and I think we have to stay strong in our faith. And uh, Bruce, you saw both of those crises up close. What, what do you think are the lessons that could be drawn from them and applied to what we're going through now? Uh, well, the first lesson is we all need to take a deep breath. Our societies our human spirits, our God-created beings, we are resilient people. We, we will come through this. This will, this too will pass. We will be emerging from the other side of this. We will be different. We will see changes. Yet we are amazingly hopeful and people who, 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 have, who have an image of God for hope inside us. And that is what I think carries us 
um, in this in this current crisis. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I actually ended up going to uh, to a uh, to a uh, to Cambridge in my MBA there, and the college I was in was established in in 1350. And the reason the college, Trinity Hall College at Cambridge, was established in 1350, was to retrain clergy because they all died caring for the poor during the Black Plague in Europe. And then, you know, I then I go into a career where I'm, I'm absolutely, you know, exposed to the Ebola, the HIV work. Uh, we've seen we, we've seen measles epidemics where there's no vaccination for children, um, just wipe out, uh, you know, just an ignorant amount of children who should have been protected. So when you when you when you get into the societies that are impacted, when you have orphaning rates under HIV AIDS of one in every five ch children in that country are orphaned. And then you think of how do we build a society, a community, when that number of children aren't being cared for properly, not being educated, not being given health care. And yet I looked, you know, 20 years beyond when I was in the midst of the HIV AIDS crisis in Africa, and I see amazing hope coming out of those same children um, that were previously we thought were going to either be abandoned or, or, or or be turning into children that would just create civil unrest and disruption of the society. No, they're actually children who are contributing to those societies in, in amazing ways. So there, there's an amazing resilience in us. And I think it's a God-given gift of uh, looking forward and of being people who actually seek, seek the best uh, for the future. And my prayer is that we all stay in that place of encouragement and live in that place that we have hope. That's a that's a wonderful message, and uh, it it reminds me of the men and women I know who work here in the healthcare system in New York. I'm based here in New York City, and I have uh, received messages from them over the last several weeks saying, you know, could you ask your brother Jesuits to pray for us, to pray for my colleagues, to pray for our patients, that uh, you know that we'll have the strength to do what we need to do. Um, which raises another important question. How do we care for the carers, right? How do we make sure that the people who are there helping are helped themselves uh, to get through this experience? I imagine it's very tough. Mary, but what has been your experience? Well, I, you know, the pain and suffering that our healthcare workers have seen uh, over these last couple of months is like nothing that they have ever seen before. This is, uh, you know, a magnitude that has never been witnessed before in this area. And um, they're really heroes. And uh, and I would agree with Bruce. Um, the hope that abounds uh, throughout the organization is tremendous. And you know, the Ministry of Healthcare is is filled with per personal sacrifice on any given day, let alone during a pandemic. Uh, and these people are incredibly resilient, but the, this virus has been relentless and, and the workers are exhausted, both emotionally and physically. And uh, it's a journey of healing that's going to take time and require support. Uh, and we have to listen to them and, and we need to watch out for each other. Uh, you know, we're offering here at, across the, the system, we're offering reflective resources with meditation, uh, and group or individual therapy. Um, we've been live streaming mass, which I know for me personally, uh, watching uh, mass every day from St. Patrick's. I, I uh, have watched the recording every night before I go to bed. That personally has helped me. Um, but we also have frequent rounding of behavioral health uh, individuals, uh, spiritual care workers and social workers. Um, and, and also communication, I think that's really very key. Uh, we, we communicate every day with emails to the staff and town halls and electronic billboards throughout the, uh, throughout the organization so that people feel connected and that they know that there are services that they can utilize, uh, whether it's through employee assistance or through community resources for mental health. Um, we also, you know, one of my favorite things that we did is we started pop-up pop-up markets at each of the hospitals so that our healthcare workers didn't have to go food shopping or, or buy the necessities that they needed for their own families. So I, I you know, I think that was one touch that, that really was important to me. And, and uh, most importantly, uh, we celebrate the wins. And I think 
that uh, we, we do that every day. Every time we discharge a patient, we actually have a full celebration where there's a parade uh, escorting the patient out the front door with music playing. And, and, uh, and, and I think that is uh, an aspect that uh, needs to be recognized, that we have done an incredible job. These healthcare heroes have done an incredible job. No, amen to that. Um, we have some questions from folks who are watching, and uh, I want to make sure that we are able to get to them. Uh, one we can deal with right off the bat, and uh, I want to ask it of you. It's a simple question. I know the answer, but uh, you know, people ask it, and it, and I want to give you a chance to respond to it. You know, as Catholic organizations, is your main focus on serving people of faith who are in need? Um, we take care of everyone. We take care of everyone. Right. Everyone regardless of faith or any other uh, feature about them. Uh, whoever needs help, you know, we're there for them. All right. And I think that's all, that's certainly true of CMNB too, isn't it, Bruce? That's right. Yeah, absolutely. We work with so many diverse populations around the world. So, yes. Yeah. We do the work because of our faith, not because of the faith of the people we serve, right? Yeah. There's a... Um, there's uh, also another question here, uh, which I think might be helpful. Uh, other than through uh, continued prayer, which of course is a really important help, uh, what more can I do as an individual to help uh, end the pandemic? Bruce, do you want to take that? Uh, sure, I, I, sure. Uh, there's. I know a great organization that you can uh, help out. <laughs> I do. Uh, I just I kind of I, I had that up, and I have some great board members as well. And uh, we uh, right in the beginning of this pandemic, uh, right in the early uh, early weeks of, of March, we actually put out put together a 1.9 million dollar sort of uh, emergency appeal for responding to. Um, what we believe the communities in many of the low resource countries are going to experience with, uh, with this, with this, with this virus. Um, so we're right in this place of protection, um, and really trying to make sure that the health workers are protected. Number two, we're really trying to make sure the prevention messaging gets out that our community health workers are in the communities, working with the communities, letting them know social distancing is important, that anybody has certain symptoms needs to be treated in certain ways. So um, all that we're doing is actually generated by the great uh, resources that uh, CMMB constituents are, are making available to us. I think we're at $700,000 of our 1.9 million uh, fundraising goal. And that is to, to actually cover five countries, multiple health systems, probably around 1,500 uh, community health workers um, and on a numerous amount of, of, of clinical health workers as well. So we're basically buying the protective equipment. We're basically uh, purchasing um, all kinds of um, uh, hygienic, uh, we're providing clean water, we're drilling new wells so people can wash their hands, we're setting up triage systems where the communities actually know how to actually assess um, and to, to guide people who may have be symptomatic. And we're also part of a surveillance system that actually helps the, the health authorities in those countries to monitor what's going on and there can be adequate response. So yes, we, uh, we, 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 we're an organization based on donations and we've been around for 110 years doing global work and uh, we're right in the middle of this. It's, it's a, in fact, it's, I, I tell my staff, this is no better place to be than at a mission that is driven by healthcare, a global mission at CMMB because we are making a difference. We'll continue to make a difference in the lives of so many of the vulnerable people around the world. I was uh, I was just saying to my staff earlier today, uh, we're in, of course, very different work to, as journalists reporting on these things and commenting on them. But I say, you know, it's actually a gift to in a crisis like this to be able to do something, to know what you have to do and that that thing is actually, you know, your job, whether you're a journalist or a physician, health care provider uh, or leading an NGO, um, that there there's a certain that in itself is a gift it would helps i think with that sort of that sense of of helplessness which we all feel on some level and so uh, one one question that i wanted to make sure that i asked both of you is is, is there something that you could share with us about how this experience um has has affected you in some way you know either a grace or an insight or caused you to think about something in a new way um over the last several weeks 
for me, I think um, the word community uh, has taken on new meaning. Uh, you know, we always talk about being in community, but um, the outpouring of love and support from uh, members of the Rockland and Orange County community has been tremendous and has been very uh, touching for me. And also um, resilience. Uh, I, I think looking at our healthcare workers and seeing just what an incredibly wonderful job, I, you know, it, it does inspire me. Uh, and I am very grateful for all of that. You know, it, it has given me much to reflect upon during these months. Bruce, how about you? Yeah, I, our staff has been amazing. I, we've pivoted to this new way of working, right? We're all working remotely except for our frontline health workers. And uh, it's just been amazing that our staff have shown this grace, resilience, flexibility, and, uh, just in continuing on mission, right? They're, they're, they're focused on mission. And the other is our country directors in these countries, they're all nationals, South Sudanese woman, uh, Kenyan, uh, Peruvian, uh, Haitian, Zambian. Uh, they, the, the, the leadership that we have and the inspiration they are to their national context and to the communities we serve has, has just, I, 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 they, they have risen above every expectation I could have had and I, I'm so proud of them. Well, Bruce Wilkinson and uh, Mary Leahy, thank you so much for uh, joining this conversation. And my thanks to all of you at home who have been watching uh, and learning along with me uh, about what is happening on the front lines uh, of this crisis. Uh, you know, I think uh, I, I would be remiss as a priest if I didn't say our first duty is to pray, uh, to pray for our, our healthcare workers, to all those who are, are, are coming to the aid of others uh, to those, for those who are suffering, uh, for their healing, for their consolation, and also in gratitude um, for the helpers who are making a difference. Um, so uh, my thanks uh, to all of you for watching and uh, be assured of uh, my prayers for you and your families in the days and months ahead. And now I'm gonna turn it back to David uh, from the Sheen Center. Thank you, Father Malone. And uh, I'll just take up with that same thought about gratitude. Uh, thanks to Father Malone. Thanks to Dr. Leahy and uh, Bruce Wilkinson. Uh, and thanks to you. Um, I, again, we, we can't do it without you. Um, you know, uh, Bruce was talking about how we're really all serving the same mission. We just do it in our own way. Um, and um, so I, I encourage you, I encourage you to support CMMB. I encourage you to support American media. Um, of course, I encourage you to support the Sheen Center um, because uh, with your help, we can continue to live in that space that Bruce was talking about, that space where we have hope um, as, as the, uh, the, the tag of American media says, because hope is a breaking news. Uh, and uh, we wanna continue bringing that hopeful news to you. Uh, so again, thank you. We invite you to join us next week uh, for uh, our, our next uh, Wednesday streaming event, which we will be announcing later in the week. Um, and uh, until then, we keep you all in our thoughts and our prayers. Uh, stay safe uh, and be well. God bless and have a great day.